I am indeed here with Lloyd Blankfein here at Goldman Sachs headquarters in lower Manhattan. Lloyd, my goodness, it feels like too long since I saw you last. Great to be here talking to you again. Well, welcome to our home. Now, speaking of uh, long ago, it frankly wasn't that long ago that the only constituents that you as the Goldman Sachs CEO had to worry about were your shareholders, your clients, and your employees. Right. It's pretty clear to everybody that that's not the case any longer. Public opinion is a real risk, if not a problem. Goldman Sachs. Tell me, what does the average American think of when he sees or she sees or hears the name Goldman Sachs? Well, I think the average, uh, the average American probably had no contact and had never heard of Goldman Sachs before three years ago. Um, you know, shame on us in a way in not anticipating how important that would be. Uh, we have, we're an institutional business, no consumers. It turns out another name for consumers our citizens and taxpayers. They became important for reasons that are obvious. Uh, always should have been important, but just wasn't really part of our, uh, of our audience as we thought about it. And now we're going to have to uh, develop those muscles a little bit better than we have. Shame on us. But are you to... still in their eyes, call it the vampire squid? You know, that's kind of hyperbole. I know I, it I, is, but it's, I think it's a fair question. I Given that that's what they see, that's what they read. How do you change their opinion? Well, it's possibly, it, it possibly is. But uh, again, we're going to have to do a better job. We're going to have to do a job in getting out there and telling people how important this industry is, what it does, when we advise companies on their growth plans, when we help finance those gro growth plans, when we manage their assets for them, and how important this is for the economy, the markets, and obviously society at large. Lloyd, the world is a changed place since you became CEO some six years ago. Tell me, how have you had to change your priorities as a consequence of that? Well, the last few years uh, in particular have been um, a lot about um, having to deal with this risk management complexity of the time leading up to the burst of the financial bubble. And of course, there's been some absorption in the aftermath. In the larger strategy, the thing that we're dealing with, which by the way is a very big positive for the world, certainly not a negative and a positive for our firm also, is the, is the wealth creation that's going on all around the world uh, and that uh, we're engaged in benefit from and also help to support and, and that may be encapsulated in the expression the rise of the BRICS which is part of the conference here being thrown by our as asset management division today. You know managing conflicts of interest used to be a point of pride perhaps even a rallying cry for Goldman Sachs it was the thing that made Goldman Sachs different from the rest of Wall Street the thing that arguably at least in the view of Goldman you did better than anybody else. Is that still a viable approach? I think no one who is going to be effective in this business can avoid conflicts of interest coming up. Um, if you, you can do that if you only represent one client in every industry, in which case you won't really be that effective, that knowledgeable, or that influential. You won't be able to get anything done. Um, and frankly, these industries even run to each other. Um, if you advise a client today, you have to lend to that client. If you lend to a client, you need that client to pay you back. Aha, now you have a stake in the outcome of their business decisions. You give them advice, but since you're a lender to them, like every bank has to be today, you have conflicts of interest. They always have to be managed. They have to be managed. So they're as much a part of Wall Street today as they ever were. Yes, but you know, it's, it's not... The Even without prop trading, say? They're... They, they have to be managed. I think there's a sensitivity to it. I think you are going to have more prophylactics, more safeguards built. You get more scrutiny, more second guessing of your decisions that you make, which of course make you more conservative, all to the good. But again, if you want to rule out conflicts of interest, you'll just give advice to one client in the industry, maybe, never do any lending, never do any support for the capital structure of a firm. It's just not, it's just not feasible. Lloyd, Arthur Levitt, former SEC chairman, policy advisor to Goldman Sachs, told me a few weeks ago that Goldman should stop saying it puts clients first. What do you say? I, I spoke to Arthur. I think he, what he was referring to, you know, we have different aspects of our business. Uh, for example, in the market making business, we give prices to our clients and we stand and they, the client decides whether to trade or not. And we're hoping that as a result of that exchange, we'll make money, not lose money. If over time we lose money, we'll be out of business. We have other businesses where an advisor and still other businesses like our asset management business where we're a pure fiduciary. And I think one of the things we 
set out to do when we wrote up our big business standards report is go out and carefully delineate for our audience what our roles and responsibilities are in, every, in each segment of our business. As an advisor, we work for the best interests of our clients. As a fiduciary, of course, our clients have to come first. As a market maker, we have to uh, protect uh, Goldman Sachs. Well, if you're right, that you have to manage conflicts because they exist. And Arthur is right, more or less saying the same thing, that in a trading business, in a market-making capacity, conflicts are inevitable. Why say clients come first? No, if, do. in fact, it's sometimes difficult. There is that natural tension that he talks about between the buyer and the seller, and Goldman's going to be on one side or the other. There is. These things, meet, in the context, they mean different things. So in a market-making business, the client come first element in our culture is that in rough markets, in tough markets, when things are hard, when it's kind of risky for us to be the other side of what our client wants to do, if our client wants to lay off our risk, we will hold ourselves out as standing out there and doing more than other people would be doing. So, for example, when the markets were reopening in early 09, it was Goldman Sachs that was really one of the, one of, I think, one of the bravest market makers in a very dislocated market. And it didn't mean we wanted to lose money. It didn't mean that we bid as high as our clients would have wanted to because we had to protect the firm, but we were there for our clients insofar as we provided a market. After 9-11, we were the first firm to make a market on somebody who wanted to get out of a position in order to uh, flatten out their books and, and, and reduce their risk. So these things mean different things. Um, our, our, I think authors comments were, were, were reserved for a narrower part of the business. We've heard over the past year a lot about the kind of illiquidity that visits itself upon markets during yes. times of dislocation. Are you going to be as brave in the future as you were then? Because you talk to investors, traders in the market, and they say there are no bids, there are no offers, people aren't making a market. I think that's how mark makers like ourselves get prioritized in the minds of their clients by their willingness to provide the other side of what our clients want to accomplish. And I will tell you, our first duty is to not risk our capital and hurt our shareholders too much or excessively, and to manage our risks, which I think no one would debate that we do pretty well. Um, but also, that expertise is also used to benefit our clients in providing them liquidity for the things they want to accomplish. Lloyd, regulation is driving your firm out of some businesses, and the ones that you're still in are getting more competitive. The results that we just saw mm -hmm. from the first quarter underscore that. Is being a pure investment bank slash securities firm still the best model for Goldman Sachs? Uh, it suits us. Uh, it suits us just fine. The answer is yes. We have a tremendous amount of room ahead of us to expand in the businesses that we're on. For example, referring back to our to the BRICS and the rise of emerging markets and wealth creation around the world. My predecessors didn't go to com didn't go to China. They called it Red China. It didn't go to Russia. These markets that are, didn't go to India for that matter because they were people in poverty, not people who were growing their businesses and trading with the rest of the world to the extent they are. And so there is a chance to be what Goldman Sachs is in the U.S. over a much broader swath of the world, and that's um, and that's very good. And, um, and you know, I think. We are in a bit of a, in, in Europe specifically, you know, probably a bit of a recession and a bit of a slower trajectory than people would like. We are dealing on a, on a, on a near-term basis with probably what's at best a lower third quartile opportunity set. So I wouldn't make any judgments about uh, what the long-term, you know, returns of this business would be extrapolating from these poor times as I wouldn't have done from extrapolating from 06 and 07. The fact of the matter, we had a 12.2% ROE and what we would regard as a very, very, frankly, poor opportunity, relatively poor opportunity set. So what kind of ROE can you generate in a good opportunity set? I think there's a confluence of a lot of changes that are going around the world. Some will be supportive. I think competition in some ways are lessening. I think a lot has been written about how some of the global institutions um, under pressure with respect to their own capital are becoming much more close in with their own countries and less global. We are still a global bank. Our reputation and our reach into the rising economies is quite, quite strong. That's a big positive. Obviously, we'll have to hold more capital against the things we do. I think that's a positive for safety and soundness, but, prob but 
in and of itself would re tend to reduce ROE. I think if you net all these different considerations, it's a big unknown. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would, again, I would say the last quarter was over 12% ROE in a very, you know, in what I think is a relatively, um, again, let's call it a third, low third quartile opportunity set.